might as well get started. Um, thanks everybody for coming to the 3D Frontier and Makerspaces Dash event. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Dash before coming here, Dash is Digital Arts, Sciences, and Humanities from the University of Minnesota Libraries. Uh, we're working at intersections of disciplines, intersections of methodologies uh, around emerging digital tools and, and some of these methodologies, so data mining, text mining, um, mapping, data visualization, uh, critical code studies, all these types of works. And we're trying to build communities around the tools themselves across disciplinary lines rather than focusing on, say, how computer science uses this tool or humanities uses this tool or English uses this tool, um, trying to find the commonality between them and build a kind of community around that. Uh, we've done monthly events since October, ranging from data visualization and um, you know, digital pedagogy. Uh, and this one is about uh, 3D printing and looking at different spaces on campus as well as some of the philosophies behind it. So 3D printing, here's an example of one. Try to bring some lights down on the screen. Facial expression seemed appropriate for the weather outside. Um, it's one of the, probably one of the most fashionable uh, pieces of fabrication technology in recent years uh, with applications and tools like the MakerBot, um, bringing this down to a much more consumer level. You can print things in your own house. If we're talking about academic uses, there are a variety of ways and ideas and Departments, disciplines that can use this, ranging from art, um, art, architecture, engineering, different medical devices, product design, museums and conservation, in which there's a long history of you know uh, conserving textiles, conserving paintings, uh, pottery, things like that, as well as the history of science and technology, understanding how different pieces of technology were used in the past and how that be used differently today, and how that you know looks at uh, understands differently questions of labor um, and how uh, different labor processes were changed when new inventions and new technology uh, were created. Now, 3D printing is not the only piece of technology um, that can do some of these things. You can also look at um, a CNC router, a computer controlled router, a laser cutter, vinyl cutter, uh, hack sewing machines um, you know, to to build, build your own designs. I just saw something about, um, you know, garage-sized uh, thing to knit your own sweaters uh, with the, you know, with the uh, kind of not 3D printed, but uh, same kind of control. Um, Arduino Raspberry Pi is part of a larger emphasis on you know, circuit bending and hacking. And this goes back to the phone freaking and these kind of different ways of engaging with technology you see around you. Uh, but these kinds of ideas are not about and just shouldn't be about the technology. And I need an assistant to help me out with this to show what, what this means. Yeah. Right. Yeah. High five. Don't turn it on, take it apart. The wider philosophy of makers. So we just did that with a little makey makey hooked up to the space bar and connected the circuit by high five. So, thank you. <laughs> um, again, it's this way of thinking differently about the world around you, where things are at. Um, this was, I went to a Tesla Works meeting, which is, if you haven't heard of that group, they're one of the best groups on campus. Um, and one of their officers, you know, her idea for this was, don't turn it on, take it apart. Um, thinking more about what is what is around you and how those things are made. Um, let me talk about this in teaching. It's collaborative project-based learning. Um, you are not getting taught by an instructor in the same way you are learning from your peers. Um, again, you get a better understanding of where these things come from. You, you, know, you can see, many times you can see the labor behind this. You know, on the back of this makey makey is this is the circuit board. You can see where they put all the transistors and things like that. Um, it's not that this is this is not a black box right here, <laughs> and it's still working. <laughs> so let's also get I mentioned earlier these questions of labor. 
you can see where these things came from. And this isn't really new. I mean, when I when I first started learning about this, I immediately thought of my great grandpa grandfather who would go around um, the neighborhood. He would be you know alley ranging and find um, broken equipment, snowblowers, lawnmowers, things like that. He'd take them, he'd fix them, not to sell them, but to give them back to the folks. They worked better than they ever had before. So there's also this idea of critical making, which was developed by Matt Rattow. He sees this as the intersection between uh, critical thinking and this type of fabrication making uh, processes. And so looking at specifically the tools around you um, and the social context in which they're in. So he just had a hackathon that was about GIS and surveillance. And so looking not just at these, these tools neutrally, but how are they used in different types of surveillance around the world. So today's, in today's DASH event, um, we're going to have three presentations from folks here at the U of M, how they're using technology like 3D printing, um, maker spaces, other types of fabrication technology, um, along these lines of research, innovation, encouraging of, of different types of learning. And then we're going to have some time to play around with things like the Makey Makey. You can take a closer look at um, things they brought, talk about different ideas. Um, and so rather than a traditional Q&A kind of thing, we're going to get up and talk to each other and you know, do more of this kind of um, more doing rather than just sitting and talking. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Brian. First, I'd like to thank Justin for inviting me to this. Uh, I'll say from the beginning that 3D printing for us is, is new. We've only had our printer for maybe two months. Um, a lot of that is over the Christmas break. We're being gone, so we haven't done a lot with it. But, uh, I work in the uh, X-ray computer tomography lab, which is over in Berkeley Hall. And the primary purpose of that lab is to do research. Um, it is later expanded. We found that it's a great educational tool for undergraduate research. Um, it's easy to learn. Uh, you, know, you can apply it to many different types of uh, problems. So for undergraduate research, it became a huge hit. Um, so I'll just go over the lab briefly. Um, and then talk about why we got a 3D printer and what we're currently doing. So this is the CT machine. Um, basically, it's just a giant red box with an X-ray source and detector in it. Um, you scan things, uh, process them on the computer. And we had this. This has been on campus for almost two years now. And during the past two years, it's people started asking about, since we're collecting all this 3D data, what can we do with it? Can we you know, print things? Um, so this is the x-ray source. Uh, this is the detector. Basically, you put parts on the stage, you rotate it, and you scan it. It's just like a medical CT scanner, only we rotate the sample, and this is much, much higher power. So there is a, we don't want the the sample to move when you're scanning, so it's a half of the styrofoam. Um, and the object that gets in there is this meteorite, and that's just a close up of it. So basically, we spin this 360 degrees and take you know, normally about a thousand eight connections of it, and then we have a computer algorithm to reconstruct that into a 3D model. And I won't go through all these, but you know, here's a, and this isn't a complete list, but these are some. Applications, um, I'll highlight, we do a lot of paleontology and anthropology work. Um, we've done a lot of mechanical engineering and electronics. Um, and there are quite a few industries in town that come over to use the machine. Um, some of them even have their own, uh, like 3 m But when they need to scan larger items of higher power, they come use the lab. So, uh, this is just an example of how we collect data. So if you have the sample, you put it in and take the radiographs from those that you can build a 3D volume. Um, those can be sliced at any angle for a needle inspection, or they can be uh, 
surface, and then once you have this surface, that's where you can get the um, I know, I think the MakerBot, we, they have a surface scanner, so if you don't have a CT, you should be scanning it off. Of. So here's some examples of you know, what, what we're doing. Um, for paleontology, we have a group that looks at tooth, mor tooth morphology. Um, this is an example of teeth that have been, it's these teeth that have been scanned and surfaced. Um, and so I'll pass these around, but um, we then, I don't think these are the exact same teeth, but they're teeth like it. So then we, we print these out. Um, and they've, they've asked us to print, print these, uh, you know, scaled up so they can use them as teaching aids. Um, so another paleontology application. Uh, these are dinosaur bones that they didn't want to destroy, so we scanned them. Um, and there may be some interesting printing that we do in the future. Um, so there's a lot of things that we, we have that they don't want to pass through in the classroom um, or we have to give back to the museum. Uh, so since we can't use the real thing, that, that was another another uh, application of printing these items to pass through in the class. Um, let's skip through this one. Um, these are um, composite materials that have been scanned at one micron resolution. Um, we have not, and probably will not print any of those, but um, we can do, we can get pretty good detail with our machine. Um, so this is the U of M's vet department. Um, it turns out that we have the largest collection of uh, urinary stains in the world. They come in by hundreds a day. Uh, and they're doing a lot of research on this, trying to figure out how they can draw these stones um, and apply that to, to humans. Um, so we may be printing some of these in the future. Um, this was this was a good one. This is um, for mechanical engineering. They were using this um, metallic foam with a heat sink and a piston, and they wanted to do some modeling. Company would not mold them um, the geometry of the mesh was, so we scanned it. Um, and then they took that back and created a, a model out of that. And we could, we could then print that also. And then we have used it to look at electronics. There's a few companies that sometimes, this is just an example of you know, if you have a drive, but um, sometimes when expensive things stop working, um, we will bring it over. Uh, and so anyone can use the lab. We are a school-based center, but um, you know it's, it's broken down by U of M people and then external academic. And uh, the U has a uh, this I Prime program that connects facilities with industry, um, and then you know, industry. And actually, McAllister is a big user of the lab. So people started asking about printing things for the classroom. Um, people have rocks that have fossils in them or something of interest that they don't want to destroy. Uh, so we can scan those and not just print what's inside that they want to look at. Uh, and it just, question, people kept asking about it. We decided to finally buy one. So we decided to get the maker box to try to move several other universities have had one that didn't have any problems with it. Um, it's, and it's cheap. Um, it has a limited build area and resolution, but it's out of point. Um, yeah, so we also, um, we have to have fixtures to put things in our machine. We were having a machine shop make them. It, it, it cost a lot of time. Uh, so now we just, whatever we need, we just print it. And it's, Um, so the maker bot, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but the build volume it's basically six by six inches and uh, almost must be a foot long. Um, so it's fairly large. Um, I guess the limitation is that 
it's not a hundred micron resolution. I don't know how that compares to other sort of countries in the industry. Um, I guess it works fairly well. The file size is not better than that with the two log in there. Um, and it does handle these introducing SPL files <coughs> fairly easily, so it's a pretty simple thing to use. So this is the, the printed this too if I was just showing you. Um, so it does this thing where it, in spots where it doesn't contact the stage, if there's supports under it, it can then let it tear off. So uh, it's just uh, there's just a couple of things that we printed. Um, uh, this is one of the most important examples. I would say we probably printed less than three items at this point. So, um, this is a, a working recorder. So, we printed it just. And then for the MakerBot, they use MakerWare. So this is just an example of their software. It's pretty easy. Uh, we generate the surfaces of XML files. You dump them into the software. Arrange it how you want. Scale it. And it makes the files of the He's printed in about half an hour. So obviously the, the larger and better resolution is the longer takes to print. Um, so we're actually still exploring the usage of this printer. Um, I'm sure we'll think of more and better things to do with it, but at the moment um, it's relatively new and not everybody even knows we have it. So um, hopefully it'll work and get around. So another thing that we printed was a skull from the Bell Museum. Um, and the, this kind of, this type of item, this it built the structure inside it. So this is the only thing I, I don't really like about it, is that uh, in order to print something like this, it has to print those supports and then you can print different ones. Right. So people, people pick this up and look at it and think that that's part of the <laughs> but, and then within this box, you'll see this is just to show um, it's actually a pretty good reproduction. The one that's colored is the you know, one that's scanned, and then the black one is the one that's printed. And they're, they're pretty close in detail. So uh, we do a really good question to do all of these, but it's a very strong relationship with the, with the reporter, so I'm not going to be that could be touching that one. <laughs> 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 well, if you Uh, I'm Kevin Rankin, I'm from the Digital Application Lab, I'm from the College of Design in Madison Hall. Um, I don't know that this presentation will be quite as thought out as uh, Kyle's, Kyle? Brian's, Brian's was. <laughs> Sorry, Kyle's it'll, be, it'll be more thought uh, out than mine, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Kindlespire, who is our Digital Fabrication uh, Specialist, got an early delivery on Monday of his second child. So he was going to do this, and <laughs> I'm not. I wasn't. But now I am. So here we go. Um, the Digital Fabrication Lab over at the College of Design is 
uh, basically an extension of the student shop at the College of Design. So everybody who works in the shop also works in the fabrication lab. Um, and 3D printing is just one of several tools that we have, um, sort of on the digital side of our lab. Um, our 3D printers are Stratasys 1200 uh, machines, which are sort of more on the commercial end. It's sort of Stratasys' lowest level of 3D printing technology. Um, these machines have a build area of 10 by 10 by 12 inches. They work in very much the same way as the MakerBot. Um, in fact, these are machines that were reverse, reverse engineered by Green Credits to make the MakerBot. Um, initially, they were reverse engineered to make RepRap machines, which are sort of the first sort of hacker 3D printer. Um, and now, obviously, um, it's kind of gone viral, and everybody's making 3D printers of this type. Um, there's some misconceptions that 3D printing is fast, inexpensive, and easy. Um, I'm kind of a realist when it comes to 3D printing, and I realize that aside from sort of your hackers, um, that's generally not the case. Um, printing a full volume build on these machines can take up to three days, so it's not overnight. Um, consumables for these machines cost roughly five dollars a few inch. Obviously, there's capital expense of roughly $40,000 per machine. Um, we have explored sort of the more consumer level of the, the desktop production machine. Um, we made an early generation MakerBot and the kits um, and just found that the reliability wasn't there, the ease of use wasn't there, the durability wasn't there. So we invested um, in sort of the lower level of the commercial industrial side of machines. Um, we do do 3D printing for other departments. Um, primarily, our, our labs are for college of science students. We're supported almost exclusively by collegiate fees within the college. So we're not really an open lab, but we do do 3D printing and allow laser cutting uh, for other areas of campus. Our rate for consumables for non college of design work is $10 per hour. So, large parts can certainly get expensive. Um, we have technicians in the shop and lab until 10 o'clock, Sunday through Thursday. Um, Saturday and Sunday, Friday and Saturday hours as well. So we sort of, since we're an open student lab, we have a, a unique sort of capacity for throughput since there's always people there. Um, we'll generally respond to inquiries um, about printing parts within an hour, two hours maybe. And aside from times when we're really busy with the 3D printers, we can generally turn parts around in a day or two, depending upon the size of them. Um, just some examples of the sort of parts that we print. Um, the bulk of our printing in-house or early college design students is for our toy product design class. Um, so we have a lot of these sort of fun toy-like objects, um, sort of an interdisciplinary degree in the college school and, and engineering and policy schools. Um, we do a lot of printing for um, the Carlton School of Entrepreneurship classes, um, biomedical engineering, sort of anybody that can create a file, um, which again, misconceptions that it's really easy to make 3D printable files. Um, it's possible, and if you know how to use proper tools, you can do it, but um, unless you're just downloading parts from Thingiverse or some similar uh, pre prepared parts, there is definitely a learning curve to learning a 3D design file. Um, others, other digital uh, output devices that we uh, the capabilities that we have is laser cutters. We have four laser cutters. These are sort of the workhorses in the shop. They're, they're widely used by design students. Um, using yourselves, we have simple tutorials and templates on our web page that the students use a lot. Um, I would guess, you know, upwards of 30,000 user hours a year that these machines are running. Um, we got our first laser cutter in 2003 and now we're up to four and this summer we'll be adding two more. Wide variety of materials can be cut, wood, paper, plastics, fabrics, rubber, or um, sort of anything. We'll, we'll try to lose anything once. Our rules are if it doesn't stink, smoke, or start on fire, um, we'll let you cut it. Um, so people bring stuff in all the time and we work with them to figure out the most appropriate uh, materials to cut in. Like the 3D printing, anybody on campus can use the laser cutters. Um, see that students always have priority. So if there's people waiting to use the machine, come back another time. 
Um, and again, those templates are on the web page, they make it pretty simple to do. Most of our printing is from AutoCAD, Creative Suite, and Rhino. Um, but you can laser cut from really almost any application. Um, we use Go for Gold for charging all of our material. So if you're purchasing or using services, have money on your Go for Gold card or get a departmental Go for Gold card associated with the correct EMS string and you can just charge it to that account. Just some examples of laser cut work. Um, again, a lot of architectural modeling, um, the toy pod design class, some prototyping. Apparel students are sort of increasingly using the laser cutters. Our laser cutter beds are 18 inches by 32 inches, so that's somewhat limited as far as apparel design, um, but we certainly want to spend a fair amount. This was a full scale installation, which is, oh, 45 feet long, 18 feet wide. <coughs> Probably 12 feet tall. Um, that was part of one of our catalyst programs a couple of years ago. All of that was labor cut with small cardboard pieces. Um, Rhinoceros is our primary design tool in the College of Design. Um, and we use Black Grasshopper, which is a parametric input device plugin for a Rhino that allows you to use all sorts of different parameters um, to design your parts. So you're really not designing your part, you're sort of designing a strip that can um, design your part. Um, we have a CNC router. It's a four foot by eight foot machine with a 12 inch deep clearance. Um, makes two dimensional and three dimensional parts. Um, a little bit steeper learning curve for use. So, usually, lab technicians will uh, walk people through creating a tool path um, to make the rudder go. Um, some examples of work we do a lot of topography, sort of site modeling for uh, context of landscape and architecture scenes. Um, a lot of sort of three dimensional surfacing. And a lot of really two dimensional work that's just stacked to work out. And there's been an installation in the tech shop just about ten years ago. Um, and all of this work is done. Let's see. Um, here are some sort of bigger projects that we've done with the CNC router. If anybody's been in the wraps in the courtyard last until October or so, um, you might have seen this. This was comprised of 8,000 pencils. Again, parametric redesign using the grasshopper, of using data sets. Um, including enrollment, department head, location, and there's not a number of different sort of data inputs in the form of the design. Um, and it's very interesting to sheets of plywood, about three weeks or so to cut it all out and assemble it. Anybody needs pencil feedback? <laughs> um, this was a studio that we did last semester that was digital ceramics, where we CNC machined. Plaster molds and then slip cast ceramic into them, which subsequently got fired. Um, and then parametrically designed in draft out there in Rhino. Um, machining and plaster was not something that was uh, sort of widely done, and uh, we entered it with a, with a lot of trepidation and a lot of research. We had colleagues around the country, found a few, few people who were doing it with success, and it actually came out quite well. We, we machined, I think. 180 molds altogether over about a four week period of time. Um, this is an installation in the School of Architecture office um, that actually nothing on here is CNC machine, but it was designed in Rhino and Grasshopper Kangaroo um, and informed digitally, but then analogically produced. So I think anytime you're talking about making stuff, you have to ask yourself the question whether or not digital. Is really necessarily the best way to do it. Um, and in design, um, you know, we're always sort of constantly battling the, the inclination to think that there's a digital solution for everything, and sometimes an analog solution is better. Um, this is an installation that I did primarily um, with David or Jason Zackmer. Um, this was in the Weissman Target Studio a couple of years ago. Um, and this is 363 million pieces, no two pieces of wood are the same. Um, he was in Brooklyn and I was here, so it was a lot of digital collaboration. He sort of came up with sketches and I found it. He cut it all out and put it up in the wise room. Um, there are no fasteners holding it together. And that's, if anybody's familiar with the wraps of court, court yard, the top left picture is all the parts laid on the wraps of floor. So that, you know, it's, it's a big, it was a big piece. It's fun. Um, we have a CNC plasma cutter. Um, it uses a plasma art to cut through metal up to the top of the stick. I 
really use this one all that much. We're sort of waiting for the students to wrap up. We have a studio coming up that's going to be using it more. But it's kind of basically a laser cutter on steroids. Well, the summer we're expanding. We got 1,500 square feet, $700,000 in compact proposal. Um, we plan on adding a few additional 3D printers, two more laser cutters, CNC milling machine, which will give us more metal production capability, um, and the second CNC So that's what we need. Sweet. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation a little while ago. I'm just going to recycle it at that moment. And I remembered it was a keynote, and I got a new computer. It's a window <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, um, so I just put together a few uh, files here just to give you an idea. And this, this is kind of the start of what I'm going to talk about. So, first of all, I'm Kyle Ducart. I'm the, now the administrative director for electrical and computer engineering. I was an academic advisor. Um, and we, uh, a couple of years ago, well, a year and a half ago, we got some funding, wanted to help students sort of build things in electrical engineering um, on their own. So the idea was to give them up to $500 awards so that they can build basically whatever they want. So they apply for um, the funding, hopefully in teams, and then we award them some money, and then they go and build fantastic devices like that. Handheld. Um, their own hand Things that um, you know you could probably probably go out and buy, but the point is, is to build, right? And uh, so we did this, and then um, as we're wrapping up some of these projects, we realized we need a place to build. So the next step was to find them a place to build, and um, let me see. And so we went to, we came up with the Exceed Lab. So, and, and this is sort of a, I guess, a connection of different needs that happened in college and what we wanted to do. So we came up with this collaborative idea with College of Science and Engineering who wanted to, you know, a, there's an explosion of experiential learning and building in student groups in the College of Science and Engineering, probably all throughout the campus. So the idea is to sort of um, allow for that explosion to continue because they need space to build and space to, to build all the things that they want to do in all their student groups. And there is no space. As I always tell people, it's easier to get money than space around here. And um, we had a, um, a group called Innovative Engineers who build, they build wind turbines and now water turbines and they take them to Nicaragua and they, and they do these great things and they install them um, for villages and provide electricity. And they had this room and it was a giant mess. It was just, they just somehow had gotten this room and it was just full of junk. Um, and all their stuff, and they never put it away, and they just went in there and they built, and, and they did a great job, and they did wonderful work. And then we had a group, Tesla Works, which was already mentioned, who uh, they had all kinds of student fee money, but they had no place to spend this money. And then we had the College of Science and Engineering, who was trying to implement our project-based learning sort of component to their freshman class. And so we brought all those people together, and then we had our department who wanted to provide some space too. And those four people come together, and we get some money from CSE, we get uh, money from Tesla Works for, to buy tools. Innovative Engineers goes, hey, why don't we share our space? 
it's not really theirs, but they thought it was theirs. Um, <laughs> uh, and DCE goes, yes, this sounds like a great thing to do. So we uh, remodeled it. Does a works ordered a bunch of tools, and the idea was to have actually a set of three rooms: a workshop, a storage room, and an electronics sort of shop. And of course, we're electrical and computer engineering; we have electronics equipment everywhere. But as what happens in our majors in CSE and across campus, you know, it's it, um, everything gets you know the word everybody uses the word silo or whatever. So they go and do their electronics projects, but they don't learn anything about or do any projects that have much to do with the mechanical engineering part of it or chemicals or all the other things that are happening elsewhere on campus. So the idea in a maker space like this in the Exceed Lab is that you bring uh, all these project ideas together and we're not so worried about separating the majors. Um, the envision projects that I mentioned what often include students from multiple majors and they would, um, um, the, the, of course, the student groups like Innovative Engineers include students from all over. The president right now, I think, is a chemical, is a chemical engineer, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, somebody said yes, okay, so good at confirming that. Um, so these student groups are composed of people all over. Tesla Works has people from Carlson, College of Design, tons of students from CSE, and so. This space is meant to bring them together to be able to build those things together and, and create those types of things. So we remodeled it. We, um, I came up with this goofy name, Exceed Lab, and this is going on the wall. I'm putting this definition on the wall up there as a quote today that to say yes to exceed, verb to go beyond the limit, beyond the bounds of limits, so to be greater, to excel. Sort of giving the idea of what is supposed to happen in that space. Um, this is where you go to do more than what you're supposed to do at school. And this is where you go and build, as I was as an academic advisor, I was told students that what you're trying to do is build a story or a narrative about your college experience that you can share with employers or other people. And this is where you build that narrative that's interesting. You can build the narrative where you go to class and you get A's, but that's a boring narrative that hundreds of people do here. But you can go here and you can uh, build a narrative where you Built an animatronic barbership quartet featuring four President Kaler heads. And Tesla Works is working on that project right now. <laughs> so that's an interesting narrative to build, and, and you can talk about the, the problems that you had and the things you overcame to do that. So that's the idea. Um, so I'm going to show you just a couple pictures of the lab. And this is a totally work in progress so far. This thing opened kind of in October. And it, uh, we're working out a lot of things. We're giving lots of access to people. So here's one. You can see we got workbenches in there. We got tools up along the edge. We got all these cabinets we bought. And then I ordered whiteboard paint and we painted them with whiteboard paint. And so all the cabinets are whiteboards that they can draw on. It's kind of a mess. I took these pictures the other day. And you can see we have storage problems already. Look, there's, there's this junk on top that should not be. <laughs> and we'll see some other pictures here. To get an idea. Here's another angle. We've got a touchscreen monitor in there that we're using uh, open source software called Wise Vision to develop with uh, um, where we put our own content on there, um, interactive. Uh, we've got a sound bar up there that students can Bluetooth their music into. It's got TV, so they can watch TV on Saturday while they're working on the project, watch the Gopher game, right? Um, uh, computer, microwave, all the, the sort of social elements over there. So students come here and hang out all the time. That's, that's a big part of what's going on. This was a hydrostatic wind turbine project from Innovative Engineers. So they have this huge project. It was stored down the hall. They had to bring it in here to work on for a while. So we have the ability for students to sort of reserve floor space for a while to work on big projects. Um, let's see. There's our uh, one of our wonderful machines that has works brought for us. Um, here's another one, a bandsaw. So right now, nobody can really use the bandsaw because we have to figure out safety. So these are parts of the problem. So I have the keys in my office and just kind of sit there and people look at it. And we try to, we're, we're in the process of figuring out how to train people to make sure that it's used safely. Um, picture of our whiteboard cabinets for storage. And the idea here is students reserve space in, this, in these cabinets 
for the projects. They reserve it online. We um, we assign them space, and then they have a couple of shelves that are marked, and that's where they keep their materials and the bins on top. And then the tools are available for everybody's use. Um, and that's kind of what the Exceed Lab is. Um, so we only have this is one room. We have a storage room, and I'm trying to work on a third room as the electronics get cut. But so far, is it working? Yeah, students are always there. Tesla Works holds their meetings there, or they hold their meetings down the hall, and then they come to the projects in here all the time. We have the University of Math Scientists use it. The CSC Expo, which is another student group that's trying to create all these projects and bring all these uh, middle schoolers to campus to show off all these interesting things they build this semester. They're all gaining access and going to use the lab. So it's a mix, and it allows them to all come in, share the space. Now, I think one of the issues, what's interesting with the two presentations earlier is, you know, we students are asking for 3D printing, CNC machines, laser cutters, and what I would like to do is be able to have some guide to provide that service to them without investing in the capital and the safety uh, issues that go along with that. So that would be hopefully something that could sort of work in this, because I think a student wants to 3D print something, they have no idea what to do uh, unless they know someone. And this brings people together, spaces like this, and I hope, I hope more departments, especially in engineering, decide to do things like this, or that we end up with our own college space that does the same kind of thing. And it's, and I guess I have an unofficial mantra about this: faculty are not allowed. Um, and that just gives the impression that this is about outside the classroom. It's not connected to any of your classes. Hopefully, you're taking some of the stuff you learn in your classes when you're taking them here, and you're just doing interesting and fun and innovative. So that's the Exceed Lab, and I hope that makes sense. I did not have my presentation to keep me on track, so I, I hope I hit my points. I it was full of animation. Oh, it was good, because I didn't make it. I had this to make it. <laughs> when I had the Tesla work studio, it was fantastic. It's beautiful. There was thermite involved somehow. Oh, <laughs> technology and beautiful design. Those colors, I don't know what they are. It's so that's not my strong suit. Cool. Well, thanks for the presentation. Um, I guess we can take a few questions if there are big, big burning questions on your mind that you want to ask individually. Probably someone else might have them too. Or what projects are you guys working on that you might, you know, want to use some of this equipment for? Let me take out some parts. Yeah, sure. Nice. The one that was always good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing yeah. exciting. The good parts, you can say. I have a question about uh, the Exceed Lab. No, uh, no professors, no 